this is how you cross over from Israel to Gaza. And right now we're in no man's land. Prime Minister, do you now regret when once asked what your favourite joke was, you replied Nick Clegg? And Deputy Prime Minister, what do you think of that? Mr Trump, why should you be president? What makes you fit for the role? Is it just one big ego trip? Thank you very much. People aren't sure they can trust what you say. You exactly. say things and then it turns out that they're not quite what you say. And if we deliver what we say we're going to deliver. My name's Andy Bell and I've been a journalist for over 30 years. In this podcast series, How Did We Get Here?, I ask contributors to provide context and background to a big story in the news. This week I've been in the US, where the COVID pandemic has killed 400,000 Americans. I've been talking to Jim and Joe Gentile. They are twin brothers and nurses with between them 84 years of medical experience. They talk to me about how they cope, how the American health system is coping or not, and whether a change of president will help the fight against the disease. Some of their answers may surprise you. Between you, you are 84 years of nursing experience. Have you ever seen anything like what you've gone through in the last year? We've never seen this, and it's a very sobering fact that I wrapped more dead bodies in two months than I had in 42 years. And that was frightening for me, even though I've been around the block, and, I, and, it, and death doesn't scare me at all, but it was uh, sobering. And uh, actually, a little PTSD too. Post traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. you, and that was because you realised something really out of the ordinary was going on. Mm -hmm. What about you, Joe? Uh, the suffering, not not just the deaths. Uh, death didn't come easy for any of them, but the suffering. That must have been quite hard for you to to see, because at that stage, it's also very difficult to know what to how to treat them. Uh, not only to how to treat them, because that a lot of it was question and trial and error. Um, we did get a lot of support from the community. We got a lot of support from the world community on how they're doing it over in Italy and, and Europe and that sort of thing. Uh, the suffering was the thing that was kind of the hardest. And then couple that with the isolation because the hospitals were shut down. There were no visitors. So these elderly folks or these um, really uh, sick folks couldn't have their families there. And that was sobering, absolutely sobering. How did the system cope when you were working within it? Did it feel like it was coping? Uh, I didn't think the system had a clue. Uh, I don't think they, they were always being, so nurses are frontline workers. So we almost immediately adapt. We almost immediately know how to, that our job is to anticipate what's the next thing coming so I can be ready for the patient and for the physician. So we're like right in the middle. Um, and we knew what we needed and we knew we needed it before we needed it. And we kept saying that to our administration and they were like, well, we don't have this, we don't have that, we don't have this. And no, to their credit, I think they tried, but, um, be, and they stayed away. They stayed away from the front lines because they didn't want to get it. They wanted to keep running the ship. And so they didn't, I don't think they really understood the gravity of it or the effect it was having on uh, patients and staff. Well, Joe, did you feel at times that in the first wave, you were getting close to the system buckling? Oh, absolutely. They, uh, again, Jim said, I don't think they, they knew what to expect. They did not have a plan. Uh, we were giving them some of the scenarios, what's happening. So we said, here's what's happening. This is what we need. Give us what we need. We need staff. We need PPE. Um, we, we need some way to communicate with family members because you've isolated them and not allowed them to come in. And we came up with the idea of the whole iPad, you know, telephone, getting that Face kind time, of, yeah, yeah FaceTiming with the families. So it was the nurses who came up with the, the solutions. And then we asked our administration for the answers for that. Uh, and they were very hesitant and slow uh, on 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 any steps forward to helping support the staff that was on the front line with, with the resources that we desperately, desperately needed. That was the first peak earlier, and you've now gone into another one sort of following on from Thanksgiving. How are you coping this time around? Is it, does it feel again like you're on the edge, or do you feel you're in a better place? So when, when the numbers started going down at the end of the spring, beginning of summer, we said to them, okay, let's learn the lesson. Let's start hiring staff. Let's get staff in here right away. Now, what complicated it, we started to negotiate our contract. We voted our union in a year and a half ago, and then we still hadn't had a contract. So we asked, can we continue with the contract negotiations? And we said, here's what we need. We need X amount of staff for X amount of floors in, in whatever area it was. If it's intensive care unit, surgery, the medical surgical, the COVID units, this is the staff ratios that we need. 
they did not want to listen to us. That you know, they were trying to save a buck. You know, I hate to say it, so they didn't listen to us. And during the summer, we could have hired younger nurses. I don't mean to be you know ageist, but we could have hired the nurses. We could have had them um, oriented. And then when the, we knew the second wave was going to come it. in the fall, we you know with people being more mobile and the colder mm-hmm. weather, and we said let's get this summer let's prepare let's get these staff in let's orient them we'll be ready to go they did nothing they were almost paralyzed because i think there was a there was a pride fight you know contract you know union versus management whatever and unfortunately and i think that happened everywhere though i think nurses were like okay we know what we need and they were telling administrations this is what we need and again they were all slow to the to to the game do you think it was just not taken seriously enough almost let's get from the very top down, let's see, even from the from the White House down, people just weren't taking it seriously enough. Well, interesting. I, I don't know if people were taking it serious enough, or to um, if we keep the politicians out of it. I'll tell you why. Because it's hospital administration. It's those folks who own the big healthcare corporations. So our health cor- corporation, we said straight up in June, we need more staff. Zero was done to get us more staff, it seemed to us. Now, maybe other hospitals in the corporation were doing something, but our hospital, we needed, we really did need those staff to come. That was the main resource. We could improvise with PPEs. We could figure the rest out with space. We had a, we, the nurses came up with a, uh, um, the, the, what do you call it? The plan. Over, overflow plan, continuity For space plan. if we needed ventilators and more space. We needed the resource of nurses. And again, we're not the only hospital that did this. It just seemed, why in the world did we not hire the nurses? We had three, four months in June to hire the nurses and get prepared for this. We were ill-prepared just as we were ill-prepared with the nursing staff and resources for the spring. So are and you I, coping now? That's like, I mean, so where we are now, are you coping? <laughs> that's a very good question. Are we coping? I, I think nurses just cope. We that's just what we cope. do. Whatever we ha- is presented to us, we do it. Um, are we ha- still having some PTSD? Yes. Um, Absolutely. Do, do, I think our staffing situation is a little better. Um, I think the supplies and equipment a is a little better. A wee I, bit better. Can I, I just ask, when you say PTSD, post-traumatic stress, how does that manifest itself? So you're working, working, working 12 hours trying to keep people alive who, by all intents and purposes, are not going to be alive. So you do that day after day after day after day, and a normal nurse will take care of somebody, they'll get better, and the positive reinforcement you get, oh, look what I did. They, they're alive, they're thriving, they're good, and they've been discharged. That's not what was happening. We were seeing death after death after death. We were seeing people not getting better. The majority were not getting better. So, um, and, and if I made it, dying and suffering alone, that part was another piece that we as nurses didn't experience. We always could bring the, the wife of the 88-year-old husband who's passing away or the children of the, the mom or the dad who's passing away. We always had to do that and bring that support. And that was really, that really helped your soul and your spirit know that these people are going to pass, but they're going to be not with unfriendly and unfamiliar faces. Looking like this, looking like you yeah. came from You the know, head. you put this on, you put your, your hood on or what, they look like aliens. They thought we were aliens poking and prodding at them mm-hmm. instead of the way we were used to it for 42 years. Yeah. So that was another piece, the isolation in addition to the low staffing. So instead of spending time with an isolated patient, if I have two patients, I can spend X amount of time with each patient. If I have three, dear God, I'm not going to be able to spend the time I need to with these critical intubated patients. For you guys, having to deal with that, how do you deal with that? How does it, how does it manifest itself for you in your behavior? Do you just find yourself at times just being a bit overwhelmed by it. The way I deal with it, we support one another. Mm. So, um, get a little emotional. So, you drive home in the car, and it's your fourth or fifth death, and you just start, you just sob, you just cry, you get it all out, because you know, you gotta get it out, because you, when you get home, you shower, and you go to bed, and you gotta get ready for the next day. So, some of the women, you know, I shouldn't say it like that, but the women will cry on the spot, and will hold each other, and we'll support each other. Um, and diversion helps too. Do things that you love. Look at beauty. Do things that exercise. Get out there and exercise. Uh, get out there and walk around the block. Walk around the, the park. Um, 
We've had several of our nurses, uh, 20, maybe more than that now. 40s, in the 40s. In the 40s, uh, uh, nurses who've got COVID from the work environment. And um, I know four of them who have wicked PTSD and can't come back to work because they caught it, you know, in the work environment. So it's, it's hard. There isn't a lot of support. We're even talking now about that. We are talking today about that mm-hmm. uh, to get a group together uh, with some psychologists, et cetera, to talk about uh, how was it for you? How was it mm-hmm. when you were feeling it? Because there's not a lot of support. Our spouses have been terrific. Our children have been terrific. Uh, our best friends who are not nurses have been terrific in trying to support us. But really, there isn't any wave or there isn't anyone saying, hey, let's care for the caregiver. So we're trying to develop programs to care for the caregiver because we know what we need. Um, and sometimes we don't, but we know that we need it now. We can't wait, you know, till the fall or till the, you know, the spring rather. But, we but need ner- it now. nurses aren't used to asking for help. We're no, used to just, just doing it. Get mm-hmm. in there and do it. You know, buck up. You know, this isn't a war. Mm-hmm. We're not out there in the trenches. We're not dying. Mm-hmm. So let's get in. Well, some of us are, but mm-hmm. let's get in there and do what you have to do. Mm-hmm. So we're not used to asking for help. So we do have a chaplaincy at our hospital, a spiritual care department, and they come around. They say, what can we do for you? And we're so busy. We're like, get out of my way. I don't have time to talk about you know, fluffy, good feelings. I need to get these people, you know, on the ventilator or whatever. Because we don't have the staff. If we had enough staff, yeah. maybe we could sit back and take them in and say, this is what we need. Okay. Yeah, there's no debriefing. So when you debrief, you, you know, you go through it in your brain and you get out your emotions and there's none of that. Yeah, this body I just wrapped who died looked just like our mother who passed away or, or our sister or whatever. So it's, it's really, really challenging to um, support one another when you're so busy and you don't even have time to think. Uh, some folks you only have time to take a break, take a 30-minute lunch break or dinner break. Uh, we do now. We've, one thing we've learned since the spring, if we don't, we will completely crash and burn. So now we're trying to take care of each other. Slightly shift of gear, there's a new president. He's talked about making COVID a real priority. Do you feel encouraged by what you're hearing about the new administration in terms of dealing with COVID? Um, so... <laughs> Being a democratic country, and I've voted ever since I've been turned 18, I don't put a lot of faith in the politicians. I mean, God bless them, they're doing their best. But I don't put a lot of faith in them because um, I just don't. <laughs> Sometimes government is such so much red tape that it, now I am impressed that we've already been vaccinated. So that's very impressive. Mm-hmm. We did a thing uh, in, the, in the States, Operation Warp Speed, to get the vaccinations out quickly, but mm. then so did the UK, so did Italy, so mm. did everybody. So but, I'm, but I'm, they did create two vaccines in the US faster than anyone thought they were going to be able to do. Right. So that, and, and that was done under the outgoing administration. Right. And well, I think because we have the resources, I think that states have the resources and, you know, they should, they should create it for the world. Mm. Um, Unfortunately, I think we'll probably get most of those vaccines instead of sending them out the way I think we should. But I I don't have a lot of faith in the new administration being the salvation of this epidemic or pandemic. Okay. Jay? There's, you know what, as nurses, we see, don't talk it, walk it. Don't talk to me. Don't give me rhetoric. Give me what we need. And that's what is neat. Let me see the action. Uh, keep your promise. If you're going to promise one thing, keep it. Mm-hmm. And don't do it yesterday. We needed it today. Mm-hmm. Do it today. Okay, but at least with the promises, then let's start with that. Um, you know, Joe Biden talking about 100 million jabs by his 100, first 100 days in office, 1.9 trillion uh, to go to it, all of this. Does it, are you at least encouraged by that, or do you just, does it just wash over you? Washes right over me. And I think it's probably, um, to be honest with you, I'm a Trumper. Um, and my brother's a Trumper, and my wife's a Trump. We, uh, if it wasn't for that man, I don't think we would have the vaccines that we have right now with the breakneck speed we had him at. Mm-hmm. Um, because, uh, again, show me the money, talk to me about it. don't talk to me, just do it. Just don't talk. I'm tired of rhetoric, I'm tired of politics. We're old guys, I'm 64 years old. I've seen so many politicians, local and regional, go on and on and on and on and do nothing. You know, we were Democrats a long time. Mm-hmm. We're Republicans now, or I'm a Republican now. We're moderate. I'm not right wing, not job. I'm moderate. But I'm done with the politicians, especially for COVID. Stop politicizing this horrific healthcare crisis. Stop making it a political thing. Come together, 
work together, join together, and we've not seen that. And that's the darn frustrating thing. I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, or Independent. Shut your mouth and get on your feet and start walking it out because this country is in a desperate need. We need help. Can we work together? I have no faith we will. It breaks my heart. I have no faith we're going to work together. Last word from you, Jim. I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of hope. Um, so I'm more moderate, and I, I believe whoever's there is going to do their best. You know, I, I, I have a lot of faith in that. I love, have a lot of faith in the vaccine. I think I have faith in. by the end of the spring, I think this will be a thing of the past. Um, poorer countries, it'll take longer, but I think, you know, the West, most of the West will be fine. India's already gotten their uh, vaccines out, and they've created their own, actually. Now, I, I hear it's not as um, effective as, as the ones created in the West, but um, I think by the end of the spring, we'll be good. And the way we're treating it and the way we're approaching it, uh, I think we, we're getting ahead. We're getting ahead now, but just now. Like last week, not maybe, but just now, I think we're getting ahead of it. Way less fearful now. There was so much fear uh, in the spring and towards the end of that, that first wave. And then the second wave came up and we're like, well, I didn't feel as fearful. No. I'm like we know what to do. And um, if we get COVID, we get COVID. We may get through it. We may not. Okay. Yeah. And to us, it didn't matter who sat in the White House. That didn't matter to didn't us. Didn't matter. Um, as, as long as we were getting the equipment and the supplies and the staffing. Our local politicians, Republican to Democrat, worked so well together. Yeah. They were phenomenal, phenomenal for our hospital and for the nurses. They rallied for us, and it was so bipartisan. Our local team was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. I wish we would have that on a national basis. We didn't. Jim and Joe Gentile with some hope about what may be coming, but few illusions about how easy it will be. If you have thoughts on this or ideas for other podcasts, you can email me on andy.bell at itn.co.uk and I'm tweeting it at andybell5news. And please share, rate and review. Thank you for listening to this edition of How Did We Get Here? There'll be another along soon.